Hello everybody, my name is Nikhil and welcome to episode 6 of Robotics Assemble, a Saints Robotics production. We have with us Kevil as our co-host today, and this episode is an amazing one. Thanks to our director Meg who arranged this meeting. Uh, today's guest is none other than the co-founder of First Washington and member of the Executive Advisory Board of First, Mr. Kevin Ross. Side note, well, Meg, uh, can you add like applause and celebration right here? All right, yeah, thanks. But anyways, let's get right into the meat of this conversation. Uh, Mr. Ross, would you like to give yourself a more formal introduction? Uh, please tell us your name and what your favorite instrument is. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Kevin Ross, and I am a local guy to the Northwest. I was actually born and raised in Kirkland, Washington, and I uh, went to Juanita High School, which is... Uh, uh, where I did a lot of shop and STEM classes and where I learned to play my favorite instrument. And I'd like to show it to you here. So my favorite instrument is right here. No, that's not it. Let's try my favorite instrument being right there is my favorite <laughs> instrument. That is a tectronic <laughs> oscilloscope, and it is the only uh, instrument I know how to play, but it does do sine waves, which is pretty close. So... <laughs> uh, 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 aside from that, I am uh, I am I am musically uh, inept. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say my uh, favorite instrument is the octobass. I figured out what it was like about two minutes ago, and basically, uh, it's this huge ten foot or something bass with only three strings, and I thought it was actually pretty awesome. Kevin, what's Sweet. your favorite instrument? Uh, you can see it behind me. I play the violin. Played it for uh, too many years now. <laughs> nice. So yeah, uh, let's get let's get into the questions. How about that? All right. So for some viewers who aren't very familiar uh, or want to refresh in their minds, uh, what is First Washington? And I mean, what is First Robotics? And more specifically, uh, First Washington. What are the yeah, organizations? So, yeah. You know, first, first Robotics, uh, FIRST is an acronym. It stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And the goals behind the program are to uh, give students an opportunity to get a hands-on experience with, uh, with inventing and, and building and, and science and technology. And, a, and an opportunity to join a group of people who have like interests and to be part of a community that is sort of uh, focused around STEM and engineering and, and solving hard problems. Um, First Washington is uh, a large group of volunteers uh, who uh, organized uh, into, well, I think we organized in about 2002. And our goal is to make sure that, um, that we can help share the, the love of science and technology by uh, helping teams get started with FIRST and uh, and being the volunteers that run the events and help do the fundraising and recruiting other mentors and recruiting other teams. And so that, that was sort of, uh, sort of the original basis of how we got started. Um, we uh, originally started with, uh, 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 we were all FRC mentors. Um, so my first background, if you will, started with uh, uh, with an FRC team and um, sort of uh, rolled into our, as a group, the, 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 a bunch of volunteers and, uh, got together and formed First Washington and we started doing FLL events and then we did FTC events and we were also volunteers at FRC events. So we were doing all of the programs and uh, it's grown from there. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge organization now. And like, I remember uh, last year or the year before when we kicked off the 2019 uh, like um, game, the, the one that we're still playing this year uh, in 2020. <laughs> yeah, the 2020 game, sorry. Uh, we're still going to be playing 2021. Yeah, there's so many teams. There's, it was huge, like huge crowds. And I, and I really enjoyed being there too. It was, it was really nice. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's been fun to watch the program grow. It's been fun to watch... Uh, uh, it's been fun to watch the enthusiasm 
uh, renew itself every year as we bring in new folks. And it's fun to watch the alumni as they've, uh, uh, many of them, as they graduate, they head off to college. We don't hear from them for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden they start showing back up as, as mentors and as volunteers. And uh, uh, I have some lifelong 20 year relationships with people who were my students that are now in their, you know, they all have kids, <laughs> right? So I've got like first grandchildren, if you will. Um, and and it's, it, it's, it's kind of, it, that's a nice, uh, it's a nice way to be a part of a really great community. Yeah. So what made you want to start First Washington? Well, so um, I was one of the, one of the first mentors with uh, Team 360. Uh, there were uh, there were three or four, maybe four adults, five adults involved with Team 360 the first year, uh, and um, uh, we had never heard of First before. Um, <laughs> a, a, a young woman named Ashley Snodgrass showed up at the Seattle Robotics Society. I was the president of the Seattle Robotics Society, so. Uh, even before first, I was a nerd. That, that's me, very nerdy. And uh, she showed up and wanted some help with her high school robotics project. And, you know, we were thinking of some sort of, you know, little robot that might run around on a table or a sumo bot or something. And the uh, reality was, is that it was FRC. And uh, we found out about it in mid-December. In fact, it was December 15th, or the it was the third Saturday of of uh, December is when we found out about this thing and uh, we had no nothing and there was barely anything on the internet. So uh, two of us ended up flying the first weekend in January all the way to New Hampshire um, and went to kickoff um, and came up with this, with two, to you know, two shipping totes full of parts. Um, the, each one of those weighed about 75 pounds, by the way. And so they were really heavy. <laughs> I remember that. And we had no idea how to build one. Um, there were no stores. Andy Mark didn't exist. No, no, nothing existed. Um, right. So the original, uh, the original gear train was a, the insides, it wasn't even the whole thing, but it was the insides of a Bosch electric drill, 12 volt electric drill okay. with its gearbox attached. Right. And so you got two of those and that was supposed to be your drive motors. And it had this funky, ass plastic base thing that it was just, it was a nightmare, right? Um, this, the learning curve was incredibly steep. Um, that first year there was uh, Team 360. There was Team 372, Kamiak High School out of Mukilteo and uh, Team Xbot 488. Those were the first three teams. Uh, I, I, I think I'm, I may be forgetting one, but I'm pretty sure we either had three or four teams um, I think Foss High School might have been in there, uh, but I can't remember. That was 21 years ago. Um, but anyway, it was a very, very small group of folks. Uh, after the season was done and after we watched the students go through this, uh, all of the men those mentors knew exactly what we were doing. Was or they? It was obvious what we were doing is exactly the right thing at the right time. This was really, really needed. And so we were very uh, enthusiastic and, and excited about, uh, about making that grow. Um, so uh, over the next two years with no, there was nothing official. It was just a, a small handful of mentors, uh, Larry Borello, Paul Rausch and I uh, uh, started working together and we, uh, ended up starting several other teams the next year. I think we started another three or four teams that the following year. And uh, uh, my role was to encourage people to get involved. So uh, I went to the Seattle Robotics Society membership um, and recruited a whole bunch of, of um, mentors. Uh, I ended up funding a lot of those teams, which was fine. Um, uh, and over the course of the next couple of years, we, we started to grow these teams completely unofficially. We had no, like, we didn't know anybody actually at first. Uh, and we uh, there was a person called a regional director. He was based out of 
uh, somewhere in California. And I think we met him once. Um, uh, I, I, he was a great guy, uh, but I think we met him exactly once. Um, and, uh, uh, and then in about 2002, um, Larry Barello's son wanted to do first Lego league. And the only way to do that was for somebody to put on the first Lego league contests in the state of Washington. So Larry signed up to do that. And he immediately looked at me and says, you're the, you're going to be the head judge. And, uh, <laughs> so then towards the end of 2002, we realized that maybe we ought to like form a nonprofit so that we can do all of this. And that's where first Washington started. Um, it was actually the Seattle robotics association, uh, that was the actual organization that we started. And it was an umbrella organization for the Seattle robotics society, uh, Western Allied Robotics, which is the, uh, the local BattleBots group, Robothon, which is a, is a very closely related to Seattle Robotics Society, but that we, we do a yearly um, big event and first Washington. Um, so those four groups are part of the Seattle Robotics Association. So is it uh, still part of the Seattle Washington Association? For Seattle, Washington? Yeah, Seattle Robotics Association still exists, but in about 2010 or 11, uh, it, it, we, we ended up, um, we ended up divesting first Washington into another nonprofit because, uh, first Washington's budget was like, you know, over a million dollars and it was really huge and everything else was really puny. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we needed a real board of directors rather than just me and my friends. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it was, it was the right thing to do. So we formed a new, a, a, a new nonprofit, uh, still closely related, um, so the Seattle Robotics Society is still heavily involved. Uh, I'm still the treasurer. Jim Wright, who is one of our lead robot inspectors, is the president. And uh, a ton of first people still belong to the to the SRS. So um, anyway, over the years, we, uh, we, we then started doing FTC in, in 2005. And then in 2007, uh, uh, dur oh, during those years, I got to know the folks at first pretty well. And in 2007, Paul Godonis, who was the president of FIRST at the time, uh, flew out to Seattle, had uh, lunch with Larry Burrell and I, and asked us to own FRC in the Northwest, uh, or in Washington State. And uh, so that's how we became the FRC Organizing Committee for Seattle, uh, Eastern Washington University, Central Washington University. Um, so anyway, that, that there's, I was gonna say that's a very quick history of, of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, also, does every state have their own like first branch, like first Washington? Is there like a first California and like a first Nevada? They are starting to. So one of the, uh, one of the things that we realized early was uh, it made no sense to have multiple organizations doing this because, well, it's confusing to people. Um, so uh, first Washington uh, adopted all three, well, technically four programs, if you include Lego League Junior. Um, and so we ran them as a group. Um, uh, we were the first, we were the first group in the country to do that. And we remained the first group in the country to do that for a number of years. Uh, first is trying to get everybody to move to that model where there's one organization that, that runs first uh, in a state, but we've always been that way. And so we have very close ties between all four programs. Uh, other states, it's it's hit and miss. It's, uh, you know, sometimes the FRC person and the FLL person don't ever talk to each other, uh, just because. Uh, so yeah, but um, in the last year and a half, uh, we have been we as in National First have been putting in place. Uh, programs to get all, each territory, which is usually defined as a state, to have a, an entity that represents first in their territory. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're modeling that after our success. Um, mm -hmm. So what makes First Washington stand out among other robotics organizations? Sure. Well, um, uh, we have... Uh, there, there are, uh, I don't know, there are about five different robotics programs in the state mm -hmm. and love them all. They're great. Um, you know, we, we've got 
Uh, we've got first and there's Vex and uh, uh, there are still some people doing uh, Sumo Robotics. There's uh, Unified Robotics, which is epic. It's 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 really great. Uh, and uh, and and there's an underwater robotics contest. Love them all. Everybody's Water got game. the same mission. Yeah. Pardon? Total yeah. water game. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely water game. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, first, it first stands out because uh, we have the 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 code of ethics, uh, gracious professionalism. And we, we, we love the robot, but we don't really care about the robot so much. We care about the student. And so we try and make sure that there's uh, opportunities for all sorts of people to be involved in FIRST. And uh, I think that that's kind of what does set FIRST apart from the other programs. Um, the other programs emulate things like that. You know, VEX, for example, we were VEX. I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> in 2000. Uh, uh, 2004, five, and six. It was the first Vex challenge, um, and there was a uh, uh, something happened. I, I won't go into the the drama, but there were, there was some drama, and uh, and it turned out that uh, uh, Vex, which was run, owned by Vex Robotics, a company in Texas, uh, and first sort of parted ways, and uh, and and uh, first ended up going with a Lego product. Um, we still ran VEX for the next two years because, you know, and so the, the programs are, very, are are steeped in a very similar way. Uh, but uh, VEX really wanted to focus on the the contest of being, um, the contest of designing and building robots, right? They still have some, uh, some elements that came from first having to do with gracious professionalism and the humanity part. But they really sort of focus on the, on, on the robot, which is fine. It works for a lot of people. Um, the first tent is a little bit bigger, um, especially in FRC. The the problem that, that FRC is that we give the FRC teams is so big that you 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 kind of need people with lots and lots of different talents. Uh, you know, the building of the robot and testing the robot is just is actually a relatively large but uh, component of it. But it's you know. It's equally weighed with uh, with outreach and and being part of the community and chairman's award and those sorts of things. So exactly that's what uh, we like to promote here as well. Because like if we see some random freshmen or people who don't really know what our robotics club is about, I think what we try doing is we always like want to promote that we're not only the nerds that do robotics. We also have our media team, a podcast, a business. So we have like all of these different branches that it makes us like this big team that we are. And I, I think that's very important. And I agree with uh, yep. what you're saying about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think uh, um, it's an important step because, you know, um, I wish I could tell you guys that, you know, getting through high school for you all is is really hard and unique, but it turns out Dude, growing up, <laughs> you guys have the same angsty, ridiculous, well, I, the angsty, real, but weird high school level problems of, of how do I interact with my peers? How do my peers interact with me? Uh, am I, is my self-esteem up to this? Uh, maybe I should just be quiet and sit in the corner and maybe nobody will notice me. Um, all of that stuff has existed well before like, thousands of years more than likely at least as long as we've been having uh large groups of, of of young people get together and go to school i mean all of those problems uh have existed i think one of the things that i really value about first is it gives an opportunity for uh for people to book to belong to something without uh having to have outstanding genetics to be on the basketball team or football team uh we don't um your gender shouldn't matter and doesn't matter in first. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, one of the few co-ed sports uh, there, that exist on a large scale. Um, the uh, uh, and there's there are ways for everybody to be able to contribute um, and to become part of of the first community. And I I have watched with great interest as uh, I've worked with tens of thousands of students over the years and you know they, they get together 
the nice thing about first is it causes everybody's social shields to drop because you know that if you're amongst first teams, a uh, 95% chance you're really going to like everybody around you and they are not going to be uh, mean to you, condescending to you, you know, uh, and, and so it's a really safe environment to be able to talk to people and you really see it. Um, you really see it, uh, especially with the really shy kids who showed up and nobody had ever heard them speak before. Um, and after three or four years of being part of a first program, uh, you know, they, they are confident and chatty and, and realize that, um, you know, other people are just like me. And I think that's a, that, that is part of the magic of first. And, um, we all have Woody Flowers to thank for that, by the way. Uh, he was, uh, uh, Woody's grasp of humanity and his ability to be the brick wall <laughs> that refused to yield uh, to first just being a robotics contest. It needs to be a robotics contest with a large humanities component. And uh, he was right. He was 100% right. Um, and I think that uh, uh, it is a great social experiment that has proven time and time again to work really, really well. Sorry, that was another monologue. <laughs> uh, it's Good? very interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that's fun. Yeah. Kevo? Uh, or, do you want me to ask this? Uh, yeah, yeah. In what ways does uh, First Washington aim to increase the diversity of its community and uh, specifically more about the student population in First Teams and as well as the leader, adult leadership? So, um, we started with a plan. Um, when, when, uh, probably this, it might've been the second year with when we started to get things going. Um, I really started to think about, uh, diversity and what, what would be the best method for us to, uh, to help with that. When we started first, I'm going to guess, um, when we first started first Washington, which was, so we're a couple of years into doing first across the state, uh, I looked at our diversity, which was, well, really bad. Um, we had uh, a lot of boys. We had maybe six or 8% girls, if we were lucky. Um, we had uh, a lot of white folks, a lot of Asian folks, and a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, um, Southeast Asian representation. We had very few Blacks, very few Hispanics. Um, and so I, I, I gave it a great deal of thought and I looked around and uh, I realized that what we needed was critical mass. We needed, we needed to build a program into which uh, uh, it was large enough that you could come in and be anonymous in first. Um, and so uh, we decided intentionally not to focus on diversity specifically. Uh, we decided to go for scale first. And so that my, my hierarchy was we're going to go for scale. We're going to go for gender. We're going to go for, uh, 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 for race or ethnicity. Okay. And so, um, so we for the first several years we just tried to grow teams wherever we could get them and it turned out most of those teams were in places that uh, is are no surprise bellevue right uh bellevue uh, uh seattle public schools actually turned out to be hard but uh you know everett linwood i mean we, we got a lot of, of places and um it really didn't help our diversity a whole lot honestly um but we did get some scale so then around 2006, 2007, we were able to get some state funding, which was really helpful to getting some, uh, some, low, some lower income and, and uh, some get us into areas with, with a more 
uh, diverse racial makeup. And so I was really happy about that. And again, we are still, we were still focused on scale. Um, I also was happy about while we were doing that, the participation rate for uh, girls went up to about uh, 13, 14% maybe. Um, again, st I'm still after scale. Um, so um, uh, we did a good job getting the scale up. Um, so the next thing we started to tackle was gender. And the reason I went after gender before I went over the, the, the other um, sort of big demographics is my assumption was that uh, every boy uh, likely has a sister or every one of the families that's involved in FIRST likely has a sister. So uh, I, my assumption was that overcoming the gender stereotypes uh, uh, would, be in, would be easier for those who are already involved in FIRST than it would be for, uh, for uh, new folks that um, don't have STEM in their, in their world, okay? And we were very successful with that. Um, I, I think it was last year, la, la, well, the year before last, but well, the last time we had a normal season, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, First Washington had gone from about 12%. We were, we were right at about 44, 45% female participation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it, that's across all of our programs. It's much higher in FLL. Uh, it's... Uh, but we're still like 34, 35% in FTC and FRC. Um, national average was around 30, 28, 30. And uh, so we, we, uh, I feel like we accomplished that. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, but I feel really good about the, the progress that we made in, in those areas. Um, so now we've been trying to, to focus more on underserved communities and communities of color. And uh, um, this is turning out to be a harder problem or opportunity, whatever you want to call it. To me, I'm an engineer, it's a problem. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a frustrating problem. Um, there, are, there, are a number of, of, there are a number of faucets to kind of cracking that, that, that issue. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, the students are not the problem. It's the, uh, the getting adults, uh, getting adults to sign up in in lower income areas is really difficult because they are working trying to support their families and and don't feel like they've got anything to contribute um and uh the economic status of uh some of the underserved communities uh is tough um you know they they, they don't have uh they don't have the kind of resources that we do in bellevue and redmond and and you know, Mercer Island, um, they, they just don't. Um, it turns out we can get money to them, but it's getting the, it's getting uh, a, a representative group of, of volunteers to come and help and mentors to come and help that has been kind of a sticky spot for us. Um, so we are actively working on it. Um, we, we do a little bit better than FIRST does nationally. Uh, I put on my national hat. Uh, nationally, we suck uh, at it. Uh, and I, I don't mean to degrade or, or we, we just have not found the right way through. There are people at first who are wonderful working on this problem. So I don't want to I don't want to put down the work that anybody's been done. But the, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the, 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 the Hispanic and uh, African-American community in particular, um, we've had difficulties getting a, a good foothold, a good adoption, a good sense that 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 first is not normal for them. You know, th this sort of thing is not normal and it's not aspirational for, for that group of people. Um, and um, I don't have an answer for it. It's one of the most, it's the, I, we've done many, many things really, really well. It is one of the things that frustrates me the most, honestly. Um, so does that go into your like promotion of like robotics in like Washington states and like nationwide? Like you want to add more of this diversity into the mix and more of yeah. this like, uh, yeah, just like a, have a really large community of like everybody so that everybody feels united. And is that, that, yeah. that's a lot in the promotion, right? Yeah. And, and, and again, I, I, I do not want to come across as putting any of the other programs down or, or, or things, but, 
there, there were other, there were programs that were specifically targeted towards uh, Hispanics in STEM. Great, love. I, I, I appreciate what they're doing. I know that they are doing the right thing, um, but it, it, it never scaled. It would never. It, they never kind of got that because they were all, uh, they were in sort of their own little bubble and own little cocoon, and that really isn't. That, that 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 didn't feel right to me. I want them to be part of the engineering community and take their rightful place with everybody else, rather than being set aside as oh, it's the Hispanic robotics competition, right? And same thing with you know the the Black Americans. You know, I, I don't want. I, I didn't want to get into that super targeting uh, thing. On the other hand, we need to super target these folks. But I, I I'm trying to get. I, I'm. I'm and it frustrates the hell out of me it is I, I want to make sure that we bring that community with us, but it isn't just the kids. I need to bring, uh, I need to bring adults and volunteers and, uh, and the community together to be part of our community. And, and uh, um, uh, it's the thing that I failed at so far. I'm working on it. Uh, we talk anything? about it all the time. Do you think there's anything that we as a club can do to help with that problem, like to help solve it? Yeah, you know, um, there are. There, here's how I started <laughs> first in the state of Washington, and it involves uh, it involves a, a whole lot of meetings and my own personal bladder, because I went to Starbucks a lot. <laughs> I I don't know how many gallons of I don't even drink coffee I don't know how many gallons of Starbucks iced tea I had. Uh, my original method for recruiting mentors and volunteers was did not does not scale well, but it works super well. Um, I recruited hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers in the following way. I would say I really uh, I'd like to be able to tell you about what first is and what, uh, and, and talk to you about maybe mentoring or at least having your kids join a team or volunteering. Um, any chance you can meet me for, uh, at Starbucks in Bellevue 10 or 11 or 12 or one. Right. And so, and I used to do these all the time and then I would go out and I would struggle to get, uh, um, just a few people a week, but that's what I needed. And so I did that for years. Um, and so, and it adds up over time. It's effective, um, yeah. it, it's effective, right? Because uh, it turns out that, you know, if I printed a flyer, said, uh, you know, uh, dear African-American community, here's our great program. Please join us next Wednesday at 4.30 in, at somewhere, right? Th though that's, that kind of stuff doesn't work. What really needs to happen is personal networks of people need to go explain what's going on and get people excited and, and answer their questions and hold their hand through this whole idea. It, uh, and I think that recruiting somebody to take on a project like this that they don't have expertise in, right? If you tell somebody, yeah, hey, you know, we're, we're having, we're gonna do a robotics program. Um, their immediate assumption is, well, I don't know anything about robots and therefore I can't contribute. And this is outside of my world of experience and this just isn't for me. Right. And that um, is a completely valid fear. I do not I do not uh, ding anybody for having that. But the reality is, is that um, if you have interest in seeing your kids or, or your community uh, advance and be part of this large community that gives so much opportunity to others, um, you know, putting in some time and not worrying about those details. You're going to end up learning all this stuff alongside the students, you know. If uh, uh, it, you know, and, and I tell like people who have skilled trades, I was going to hold up my it, <laughs> the camera shoots over my desk here. My desk is a pigsty, however, it has great visual aids, right? So, like, you know, I'll, I'll tell them if you know the difference between the red wire and the black wire in a car, you can build a robot, right? Uh, everything else will teach you, right? If you know just some basics. Uh, and and that's the conversation that needs to be had. And all of this uh, needs to be done at a much more personal level than we can do. Um, and it doesn't scale well 
for me as an individual to go do all of that. But what it does scale really well is if a lot of people can take the time to go out and, and talk, to, uh, talk to people of color and tell them about our program, show them some videos, say, you know, this, is a, this program has meant a lot to me as a student. Um, this program is right for just about anybody. This program is a buttload of work, but the payoff is enormous. And the self-satisfaction that you'll get out of this is enormous, right? And so uh, that was my long preamble to saying that the probably the best way we're going to scale this sort of thing is for people to take it upon themselves to talk to folks, uh, talk to other schools, do some outreach. Um, but it isn't just the schools. And, and again, uh, the students will come do this if they're given the opportunity. The, the hard part for us right now is getting that opportunity to appear for them um, and helping people through their first year or two until they, they gain some institutional knowledge to be able to do this. Sorry, that was a rambler of an answer, but did that answer your question? Yeah, that yeah. did, yeah. Okay. I'll, okay, tell, I'll, tell, my, uh, I'll tell the outreach, outreach team to take some notes. We will be going to Starbucks a lot once COVID stops. <laughs> Okay. Yep, I uh, I recommend the black iced tea, the Trent. Uh, the, I just tell them give me the give me the bladder buster, which is the biggest <laughs> yeah. one. And uh, yeah, I uh, I do remember coming home many times when I was doing this. Uh, I was literally vibrating because I I just don't drink caffeine that much. <laughs> but it was it was highly effective. And uh, um, yeah. So what else do we want to know? Okay, so switching uh, topics a little, what are some of yeah. your favorite and weirdest memories in First Washington and First in general? Uh, my favorite memories are mostly students. Um, it's, uh, it's a trope. It happens every year. It happens to almost all mentors every year, but every year it happens, it makes, gives me such great joy to find somebody, a girl or a boy, who has never, uh, doesn't know the difference between a Phillips screwdriver and a slot screwdriver, and has never drilled a hole before, and giving them the drill and say, just drill a hole there. And when that happens, the empowerment that happens is just electric. It, I, I love it every year. Um, uh, I, I, I was a mentor at Chief South High School from 2002 to 2007, I guess. And the, the girls on that team, I ended up with 14 girls and, uh, and 13 boys. And the girls knew, well, actually, none of them had ever had a shop class. There were no shop classes in any of those. But I remember um, uh, two of the girls started drilling holes. And they drilled they drilled the crap out of this piece of aluminum. I just let them go. And they were just having a ball drilling, 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 drilling. And they, they, they left so empowered about that. Right. And, and those, those memories just, they, they just make me happy. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there are very few other things that are consistently a happy experience than that. Um, weirdest things. <laughs> oh man. Uh, uh, I have, uh, been, um, when I was at Chief South, I was introduced to the Urban Dictionary because half the time I had no <laughs> idea what the students were saying. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I would come home and I look at my wife and I'd go, okay, uh, you, we need to look up this, th this phrase. And we look up that phrase. And of course, you, you, you know, uh, my wife and I were, we have terribly juvenile senses of humor and some of the stuff that we read, we kind of went, wow, really? <laughs> I, I won't say any of that stuff on the air as well. I shouldn't. But anyway, um, <laughs> that, I think that was one of the weirdest experiences is the, the amount of uh, stuff that I have learned from high school students over the years that uh, they should not have known, but they did. <laughs> um Probably my favorite was playing Cards Against Humanity in the uh, Houston airport on our way home from Houston. I think it was with the Skunk Works. 
and they said, we're, we're going to play cards. You, would you like to play? And I said, absolutely. I'm thinking poker or you know, something. And I sit down and they wanted to play cards against with humanity. And it was the really raunchy version of it. And, <laughs> and I was very sheepish about it because, you know, youth protection and all the rest of that stuff. And I'm looking around and their parents were all sitting there and I'm going, are you guys okay with this? And they're like, yeah. So, so I played cards against humanity in the Houston airport. And uh, it was a great deal of fun. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. About Imagine poker. That. Oh, wait. Yeah. You yeah, go, Kevil. No, we'll no, talk about this at the end. But hey, you can go. Yeah, about po poker. So we've heard that you've played a lot of poker. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. So um, uh, I. Uh, so my, my background is I, uh, I grew up in Juanita, uh, so I'm a local guy. And uh, I went to the University of Washington. I have a computer science degree. I got that in 1988. And in, uh, then I went to work at Microsoft and I was a senior engineer on Microsoft Windows um, and OS2 and a couple of other things. But I, I was at Microsoft in the early years. So around, I must've been 89 or 90, uh, I was, uh, my wife had something to do that night and I was driving through downtown Redmond and I saw a sign that said poker room in an arrow. And uh, it was at the uh, hotel cafe, uh, which I don't think it's there anymore, but it's, it's sort of down in downtown Redmond. So I pulled in and I went into this poker room and it was gross. There, there was all these guys that were smoking. There was all these tables and well, okay, I'll play poker. So I sit down and I start playing this poker game and um, no idea what I was doing. I mean, literally no idea. So I bought in for $100, which uh, was quite a bit of money in 1989. And I sat there and uh, I would kind of follow what everybody else was doing. And I kept pushing money out. And then uh, they, I'd turn my cards over and the deal would go, Oh, he won again, right? So I won like seven, eight hundred bucks that night off a off hundred dollars, and uh, I went home and I looked in a in a book of games to find out what that game was, and what, I had I, I didn't know I was playing two cards. On, I, I I knew I absolutely nothing. It was complete luck um, that I won, and that's what got me hooked on playing poker. Um, and in the following ten or twelve years, it cost me thousands and thousands of dollars because I thought I was good at it and I really wasn't. Um, but I did eventually get fairly good at it. And in 2002, I started going to the World Series of Poker in Vegas uh, to play poker. And that's a uh, month long group of tournaments. And um, it was a nice balance between, um, between volunteering for first uh, and, and uh, I needed something to balance out my constantly giving and volunteering with the most narcissistic self-centered game on the planet. Um, so, uh, uh, I, uh, and so up until this year, I have gone every year to the world series of poker and played for at least a week or two. And, uh, I enjoyed, I, I enjoy it immensely. It's a, it's a nice way for me to blow off steam, to turn off first, to, uh, hang out with people who have different interests, uh, then first, and uh, and I very much enjoy it. It's a it's a game of of intelligence and psychology and controlling your emotions and random luck, and uh, it's just a uh, it I, it's just a lovely experience. I I, I enjoy it. Nice. And I'm pretty good at it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you want that balance of uh, helping people, being very selfless and volunteering, and then going and gambling about like thousands of dollars or whatever yeah and uh uh if you and i'm sure everybody's guessed i i i don't work i i i i i was very fortunate to be at microsoft very early so i am uh very financially uh, secure and uh, well, i'm, I'm kind of rich actually and so i can afford to go play poker you can't wait until you can afford to pl go play poker never play with the rent money um and I set very strict limits on how much money I'm going to, to gamble. And so I, I, I don't want you thinking that poker is this easy uh, thing to uh, go off and win. Do, uh, 
I do it purely recreationally and I expect to lose. And when I don't lose, I'm happy. <laughs> There's my, yeah, this is not career guidance. <laughs> yes. Don't do poker as a career, everybody. Do robotics. No. It's more fun. It is. It is. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, more uh, like current topics. What difficulties has COVID had on planning events and uh, working for First Washington? Yeah. Oh, man. So um, uh, ours, our events were the first ones to run into COVID. Um, our first week, our first week of district events was we were at Glacier Peak. And it turned out that uh, the first uh, couple of cases of COVID in the U.S. that were not related to traveling to China showed up. Um, one of them was a student from Jack in the Bot. He wasn't, uh, he's from Henry Jackson High School. He wasn't on the team, but he, um, he had shown up for school for like 10 minutes before somebody called him and says, you get, get the hell out of there because you have COVID, right? So, so there's a little bit of contact tracing. So there's a little bit of worry about that on, at Glacier Peak. Um, the next day, five people at, uh, the, at the retirement center in Kirkland died. And uh, uh, things started to sort of blossom and mushroom out of control pretty quickly. Uh, you know, once we found out about the the the, the Jackson student on Friday, uh, we ended up putting in place some uh, at the time the state of the art, which was hand sanitizer. Uh, they didn't they they weren't sure about masks, but we did hand sanitizer, and we were trying to clean up. Uh, we changed. The award ceremony, so people weren't high fiving. We we're trying to limit contact and stuff. Um, so and and so that was tough. And we we all, uh, that same weekend we also had an event in Oregon. Uh, there there were nothing happening in Oregon yet. Um, so we sort of continued on. Right. Um, Sunday morning, the, uh, of, of this event, uh, Adrian and I uh, ended up at. <laughs> In a meeting at 6.30 a.m., I think, with Frank uh, Merrick and Chris Rake and Erica Fessia. You know, everybody knows who Frank is if you're in FRC. Uh, uh, Erica and Chris are the uh, vice presidents of, of one's vice president programs, the other's vice president operations. And we started talking through our COVID plans because uh, we were the first ones and first had COVID plans, but nobody had ever actually, what they, we were hoping we wouldn't have to use them. And the intricacies of doing this uh, came into sharp contrast because by that, by the end of Friday, you could not buy hand sanitizer, you could not buy Clorox wipes, you could not buy Clorox, you could not buy uh, toilet paper. I mean, all, you know, the, all of the craziness started happening. So uh, over the course of the next few days, um, we were we literally met with first four or five times a day. And as we were getting information in and absorbing information from the health department, uh, uh, we got some help from Premira, the insurance company, uh, for Premira Blue Cross. Uh, uh, what, uh, one of our board members is a vice president there, and he had inside information about things. We were watching very closely the epidemiology and all the rest of that. And so we spent the, the, the first half of the week planning how we were going to do a socially distant sort of events at uh, Auburn and at uh, West Valley. Um, at this point, the outbreak, nobody knew. There was no, there were no tests. There was, there was no way to test. There was no, you know, and so uh, we were trying to follow guidelines, which said, well, you know, be careful, wash your hands and maybe you'll be okay. That's what the guidance was on, on Sunday. On what Monday, they know? Changed yeah, the, the, on, su on Sunday, they changed the guidance to, well, we're starting to feel a little weird about doing large events in King County because they were starting to see more cases show up. Um, and so we had another set of meetings, and so we sort of modified our plans. And by, by Wednesday, it was, yeah, you know, the insurance guys are going, I wouldn't do anything in King County. We just don't know. Uh, uh, it's... The, the, they're starting to see a lot of, of cases. And uh, 
So this whole time, what this is all we're doing for like days straight is figuring out how are we going to do this safely? We don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want to spread this thing. We are not making medical decisions. We're following, you know, the guidelines and the guidelines, man, they change like every couple of hours. So on, on that Wednesday, uh, we had a board of directors meeting with First Washington. We decided that the event in Auburn was too dangerous because there was just too many unknowns. And so we decided not to do that event. Uh, there were no known cases east of the mountains. Uh, there were no uh, no indications that it was a problem there. The, the district over there thought that everybody in King County was crazy. Um, <laughs> come on over, we're going to do it anyway, right? And so we went and we did the, the event at West Valley. And uh, um, uh, we again, we put in, we changed all sorts of things. We were trying to make sure everybody was being nice and clean. Uh, there were no masks being worn yet. Um, and uh, during that whole time, Again, we're meeting like several times a day with FIRST trying to process all of the information. And, and honestly, by the, end of, um, by the end of Saturday, which was the end of that event, uh, Adrian and I were just exhausted. Um, we're watching what's going on elsewhere and, and you know, a lack of information causes people to panic. And uh, on Sunday, uh, I was going to call her and if you, <laughs> Adrian and I are linked somehow. <laughs> uh, we, we almost always are thinking the same thing. We, we almost never disagree on things. We just think the same way. And I went to call her and she was calling me at the time. And the first words out of her mouth were going to be what I was going to tell her is that we have to cancel the rest of the season. We just can't do this. Um, it, this is getting too bizarre. And uh, so that that's when we we called first and told them uh, that we were going to cancel. And then Sunday night is when we sent the email out saying that we're canceling the rest of the season. Um, uh, nationally, uh, all of a sudden, New York started to have problems and, and other places. And so it turns out that that first went through the same pain that we did. We just did it a week earlier and they ended up canceling the rest of the season. So um Man, that was long-winded, but I, I don't know that. I figured uh, we should probably record this. So you guys just recorded the history. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> the history of uh, the COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and at the time we're thinking, oh, this will be. It probably will be gone by September, right? And so <laughs> we'll go ahead and finish this in September, right? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Here we are in October. <laughs> yeah, and we're so the, still... over the so now when I put on my national hat over the. The, from basically the, the day that first announced the cancellation of the rest of the season until uh, September, we were uh, nationally, we were, I was meeting with the first executives as their advisor, uh, and we, we looked for changes. We were, we were monitoring what school districts were telling us, monitoring what the states were telling us, and uh, it was pretty clear that I, I, there, there was just no way that we were going to be able to do FRC this year, and um, we we held out hope. We were really hoping that something would change. But um, uh, if you step back, you look at it objectively. We are not fighting COVID nineteen. We are fighting a math equation. <laughs> it's the it's an exponential growth equation, and the COVID part we have done nothing to. Uh, there are some vaccines coming. We're really hopeful about those, and those are super duper important. But the reality is, is that medically, nothing has changed since the first week of March. Um, th there's been hints that the you know, remdesivir does this or whatever, and all of that stuff is it, it just is not a bulk thing. So we've been fighting a math equation, and the math equation is uh, basically you take the number of infected people today, uh, and uh, and the number of infected people who, the number of people those infected people interact with uh, times the probability that that they're gonna pass it on tells you how many people will be tomorrow. It's gonna be whoever's infected today plus those new folks. And the only way to control this is to not interact with so many people. And the probabilities are you need to wear a mask and you need to wash your hands, right? It's really just that simple. And we're fighting a math problem in our country, and the math that, that we 
our country sucks at data and math, which is why first is so important because we know how to do things with math and data, right? Yeah. You're fighting a math problem. You're going to lose, right? One plus one equals two. The, the formula for the epidemiology is the same. It, it's just, it, it's a simple formula. And if you don't manage these two variables, right, it's going to get worse and you can see it getting worse, right? People don't yeah. wear masks, they don't social distance, they're breaking all of the rules and we're, it's spiking. So, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, we highly promote people to uh, social distance, wear masks and wash your hands. And if you don't have to go out, don't just stay home Trump and like watch the podcast or whatever. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and I get it. This totally sucks. I've been home since March, right? I yeah. haven't traveled anywhere. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'll go to the hardware store or something. And that's, that's pretty low risk because I don't really interact with that many people. But I haven't hung out with my friends or gone to the, I, I haven't been to like a bar or a restaurant with a group of people, uh, you know, and, and I get it. It, it, it. It's terrible. But, you know, you can't beat the math problem. It, it is purely, the, 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 the virus doesn't matter. The virus is. The virus is an invariant. You can't do anything about the virus. It exists. The only thing you can do is adjust how many people you interact with and whether you wear a mask and wash your hands. It's all, all we can do right now. Um, yeah. It's just that simple. And all of the rest of the, everything else that they're saying on the news is just bull crap. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, so anyway. On a, more, on a more serious note, yes. We're going to get yeah. even more serious. I have to put my glasses on for how serious this is going to get. Oh, yeah. I'll give you a very serious yeah. answer. Yeah, yeah, I have to get really close to the camera, look straight into it. Okay. Do you think we're ever going to have a water game in FRC? Yes, <gasps> I do. Yay. There's hope. There's there hope. is hope. There is hope there for is hope. a water game. You've heard it first here. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I believe that it's going to happen. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, we're very so excited. I, I, I realize I've been yakking longer than I should. Sorry about that. Um, there, there were some other questions that you guys wanted to ask that we should probably get to, huh? Uh, um, no, I, I feel like uh, overall this has been a good podcast so far, and like. Oh, okay. Yeah, I um, think we've gotten to a lot of it. Lot. Yeah, yeah, we've covered everything that we really want to, and we've gotten most of the questions like, like a bulk answer. We were able to cross out most of the questions, so yeah. So, so let me add a couple of other things. Um, All right. Because now, now that I've been yakking at you for a while, um, you know that uh, one of the one of the tough things with with this is we we really wanted to run infinite recharge again, um, and we we have plans we could potentially do it, but I'll tell you, you know, at, at this point with the, the the cases are spiking in our state again, and I really just uh, I really don't see this happening, and um, if I had to put on my crystal ball, I really don't think that that we're going to have vaccines widely distributed enough to, to even do world championships this year. That's this is my personal opinion. I, I don't think world championships happen this year either. Um, I am, however, really kind of excited about uh, the remote the remote things that we put into place. Um, the the innovation challenge, the game design challenge. Um, I think the FRC at home is going to be a bust. I don't think that I, I don't think that Washington State schools are going to be open enough for us to be able to do that. Um, the innovation challenge, you, you know, it, it uh, for us first isn't about the robots. I know that it, it's the dangly shiny thing that we drag you guys in, and everybody gets excited to build something as a team and work together as a team and make something go. Um, I think the innovation challenge has. Uh, a, a real possibility of being super interesting. Um, um, the details have not been released yet. Uh, this was something that, um, that uh, this is something that uh, we pushed for. Uh, the executive advisory board really helped hammer this through with the first executive. They've been thinking about something like this and uh, I think they, they, we gave them some good clarity and some good direction on it. Um, I think that it has all of the hallmarks of, of doing a team-based project. It has, uh, it's gonna have all of, this, all of the uh, stuff that, that makes a large team viable. Um, there's gonna be communication needs, graphic needs. There's gonna be uh, 
planning and documentation needs. There's going to be uh, judging. There's going to be uh, hopefully some prototyping if we're able to get into uh, to our shops. Uh, but if not, um, and it's something that can be done remotely. And I know that you guys are probably as sick of Zoom meetings as I am, but uh, I think it's a great way for us to sort of um, stay together as a community and and and, and also, uh, you know, do something that, that's going to make you proud. And these, uh, these are official first programs. These are, uh, um, we uh, were very careful that they, these will carry all the prestige of being an FRC team. And I'm hoping that you guys will take it as seriously as, as we did when we were designing these things. I think it's going to be cool. And uh, my guess is that it will probably survive COVID. My guess is that these are probably going to be permanent additions. Uh, at least the innovation challenge. I don't know that for a fact. That's my own personal opinion, but I have a feeling that it's going to be a, a permanent addition. And you guys are going to be here at, for the first one at the ground floor of this. And I, uh, so I hope I'm hoping that I can convince you that this is going to be. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a, a different challenge for all of us, and uh, I think it'll be rewarding. So there you go. That's my pitch for for doing that. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you. That was that was quite interesting. The entire conversation that we had today was really interesting and like eye opening. I realized that maybe I might have to go into poker as an industry, like as a career. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, so uh, poker chips. It turns out I have a bunch here. Where are they? There they are. So <laughs> I, the, the, these ended up in my pocket one day. So poker chips. When, when you play poker. You, you you end up with piles of these things and, and you know, you, you end up with stacks of them and you get to you learn how to do like rifling poker chips and stuff. These are the single most disgusting things on the planet. And, uh, and <laughs> because everybody at the table is going to fondle and touch these things um, and, and, and they, they get mixed around. And, and over the years, these things get really dirty. And it made me re now that I'm really like tuned in on things that could give me COVID, um, these are gross. And so <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to be until I feel safe going back and playing again. I may end up wearing gloves just because of the, I'm now very you know cautious about what I touch. So uh, just a, just a thought it's a, it's a, it's going to be a, a tough industry to, to, to get rejuvenated because a lot of us guys with gray hair and stuff, I'm in a high risk group. Uh, I, I don't really want to touch those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so thank yeah. you so much for joining us today on the podcast. It was oh, a blast having you here. I yeah, we learned a lot. I would say. Well, you, Kevin, do you have you learned yeah. a lot too? Yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot. Yeah, thank you, and hopefully you can come back for another one if you enjoyed your uh, stay here. I'm 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 always happy to do these things, and uh, you know, Saint Robotics has been around for a long time. Uh, you guys have always been one of our uh, our key teams, uh, one of our biggest teams, and and you have a very very good track record of uh, doing awesome and epic things. So uh, um, I'm more than happy to to help you guys out whenever you need, and uh, that way I can justify my wood hat. I have a wood hat up in my uh, up in my upstairs office. There's a shrine to first, and one of them is a wood hat that I was given a yeah. few years ago by Saints and uh, I cherish it and I, I actually wear it from time to time. Um, and uh, so uh, we have a, you guys have a long history. I know that high school kids, you, you only get like a three or four year window of the thing, but uh, my, my good feelings and, 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 and well wishes extend back for uh, well over a decade. Oh my God, it's been six. This is your 15th year. Yeah, anybody know? Yeah, we're yeah, going into our fifteenth year, year, but we've yep. existed longer as a Vex team. Yeah. Yep, yep, you did, you did. Um, the uh, and well, actually, first Vex Challenge team, sir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you guys were one of the first, first, first Vex Challenge teams that that we had as well. So uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, so long anyway, yeah. good history. If for those of you who are graduating, if I don't get to tell you again, um, be sure to be sure to find some way of tagging yourself uh, as a first alumni, whether that means getting a first 
luggage tag or, or in our first backpack, the, the key to taking advantage of your first experience is to very subtly let people around you know that you were on a first team without being irritating about it. Um, so, so <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to um, go do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 um, because, uh, opportunity comes to those who are prepared because you will randomly meet people who will provide you opportunity if you're able to take advantage of it. And the biggest way for that is to somehow make a connection. And one of the really cool things about first people is they feel connected to other first people. And I've seen this bazillion times uh, over. Uh, I can wear my first jacket. I can walk through a random airport and I will find at least one or two people that will walk up to me and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was on, you know, team 1988 from, you know, wherever. And, and you know, that uh, those that that's where opportunity and, and your future comes from because your network includes everybody who's ever been on a first team. You've got to come up with some way of, of letting people know that. Finding some way to wear a first logo somewhere on your body. I like the backpack idea because uh, let's face it, wearing a first shirt every day, yeah, you know. But if you've got got it on your backpack or something that's on your, your uh, luggage tag or something like that where somebody can look at it, that's where opportunity is going to come from. Okay, right. there you go. I'm done. All right. On that note, if you guys want to be on the podcast, email us at roboticsassemblepodcast at saintsrobotics.com. And if you want to buy our merch, uh, I don't think you can actually buy this shirt, uh, sweatshirt merch, but if you want to buy some merch, go to our website, saintsrobotics.com, and then there's a link to our merch over there. So yeah, please email us and buy our merch, and we're, we'll be happy to invite you onto the podcast. Yeah, thank you. And... Yeah, I think we should end the podcast by saying break together because that's how we end our meetings in our thing. So on three, we just say robotics break, right? Three, two, one, robotics, robotics break. 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 All right. <laughs> Thank you to all the people who helped create this episode. This podcast wouldn't be possible without you. I would like to say a big thank you to our director, Meghnad, and to our assistant director and club president, Aditya Shrey, our mentor, Ms. Sirlu, who helped to set up this opportunity, to Haley, Yuval, and Tamji, members of our imagery team for writing the questions, and to Nikhil and Kevil for being the hosts. I would also like to thank Mr. Kevin Ross for joining us on the show and making it a blast. 